We're concluding a very short and brief series called Provision today. And we're kind of examining the two primary ways that uh, we find ourselves wasting the provision of God in our lives. Last week we talked about how we waste God's future provision through debt. We actually looked at what debt does to us, why we're susceptible to it, and a pathway out of it that's far more rapid and, and fast than we might have anticipated. And this week I want to talk about how do we um, kind of waste, what's our tendency to w waste the provision of God in our present. And so we're going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture this morning. The first comes from Philippians chapter 4, and it says, My God will meet, what's the next word? All your needs. Now, when I say that, you might be going, hey, wait a second, there's some things he hasn't quite come through on yet, but just, just hang on. My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And then this passage from Ephesians Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must, what's the next word? Work. Doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those who are in need. What I'd like us to focus on today is this simple truth, and that is that the number one way God provides for your needs is through work. The number one way... God provides for your needs is through work. Work is not punishment. The Bible reveals in its very opening sentences that God himself works. Everything in heavens and earth was created by him, and he worked for six days, and on the seventh day he rested, not because he was tired, but because he was done. When you study other ancient religions, you discover that the gods of ancient religions did not work. They created humans to do their work for them. One of the unique distinctives of the Christian faith is that God does not think work is beneath him. He actually engages in it, and he created people and gave them work to do even before the fall and before sin. He gave them work to do. He gave them a place to do it. He gave them a mission to do it for. He gave them resources to do it with. And he gave them accountability to do it under. Work is how you use your energy to add value to your world. Work is how you use your energy to add value to your world. And I've been told that there are over 200 occupations listed in Scripture alone all kinds of things that people did in order to make sure that they had provision in their life. Some of the most famous are Peter was a fisherman, the Apostle Paul was a tent maker, Jesus was a carpenter. That's absolutely right. So I think that you have the same experience as I do in this. I do not have a, a, a mysterious angel that drops a box of money like some secret Amazon package on my porch every single week so that I can just decide how to spend it. I don't have that happen in my life. Does anybody have that happen? He's like, I want to talk to you right after the service. And then I don't have anyone making mysterious deposits into my checking and savings accounts. My refrigerator does not automatically fill itself up. In fact, when my son was home, it magically emptied itself every single day. So the question is, if God is committed to providing for us, why doesn't he make it easy on us? Why not just make it easier? And the reason is because God is multitasking. See, he does want your financial needs to be provided for, but he also wants to grow and develop your character. Uh, if you've ever seen a little child who gets everything they want whenever they want it, how many just long and hope to have time with that child? <laughs> you don't. We say that that child is spoiled. What does the word spoiled mean? It means that their quality is diminished. It means that their character is being disintegrated. It means that they have become unfit for use. You don't use spoiled milk and you don't use spoiled meat. And there's not much use for spoiled children either. This is what God wants us to know. Our character is actually not formed in abundance. 
Often our character is formed when we have less. Our character is revealed in abundance. There are some people who might come into some additional resources in their life, and people will say about them, money changed them. No, it didn't. Money never changed a single person. Money just revealed what was already there. So God takes us through a process because he wants to develop our character. And he wants us to become all that he intends. So how does he actually provide through work? And the first thing is, is that he gives you ability. There's certain abilities you have. There's certain intelligence capacities you have. You have certain discernment capacities. You have decision-making abilities. You have organizational skills. You have problem-solving abilities. You have mechanical abilities. You've probably heard me say this. If you ever see me under the hood of a car with a tool in my hand, for the sake of the car, distract me. I have no mechanical ability at all. Maybe you have artistic ability as well. You see, developing ability and creating ability are two very separate things. You will never create an ability in your life. But you can develop the ability that God has invested in your life. The American myth is that you can be whatever you want if you just try hard enough. I want you to know it's not true. You can be whatever God created you to be if you're willing to develop that. Say, well, I don't know if that's true. Let me just ask you, does anybody here believe I ever, no matter how hard I worked, I ever had a shot being a professional basketball player? Anybody? <laughs> One person. And they are the tallest person in the room. <laughs> just saying, okay? So, I'm not, by the way, does anybody think I had a shot at being a professional football player? No, I wouldn't last one practice session with that group of guys. I'm not built for it. The goal is not to decide what we want to be. The goal is to discover what God has created us to be. And that's when you begin to experience purpose because our purpose is actually tied to the ability that God has invested in you. It is purpose and not pleasure that makes life meaningful. See, we, we often pursue the pleasure side. What do I enjoy? But we never find meaning there. We just enjoy it. But we do find meaning in our purpose. So how do you find your, 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 your abilities? Well, I would encourage you, do some experiments. Just try stuff. And some stuff you'll figure out very quickly, I'm not good at that. And other stuff you'll see I have a little bit of aptitude for, or capacity for, or I seem to have a lot of passion in doing. That's really helpful. The other thing is listen to people that you trust because they often notice things about you that you don't notice about yourself. And when they tell you something, be willing to consider that maybe they have seen something that you have not yet identified. The second way that God provides in our work is through opportunity. He gives us the opportunity to use our abilities. And maybe you recognize this. Maybe you're in the room this morning and you go, you know what? God has given me certain uh, abilities and he's given me the opportunity and, and I feel like I'm on mission. Maybe there's others of you in the room this morning and you're going, well, I think I've discovered some abilities, but my opportunities hardly match it at all. In fact, I, I think maybe God dropped the ball on me when it comes to opportunity. And this is what I would tell you about opportunity. What you're doing right now might be temporary provision. That God is just simply giving you something that puts food on the table and clothes on your back right now, but this is not your lifetime assignment. In fact, what he intends is something else, but while he develops something in you and prepares that door to be opened, he doesn't want you to go hungry or without. So he provides temporary provision. If you are in a situation that you think is not a good fit for you, I would encourage you, keep sharpening up your resume and keep sending out applications and keep knocking on doors for opportunity. I had a friend one time who uh, he attended, uh, he was a, a credentialed minister and he attended a, a really phenomenal church and the pastor of that phenomenal church was retiring and so they needed a new pastor and he prayed about it and he believed that God wanted him to be the next pastor of that church. And so I, I asked him, I said, did you, did you send in a resume to the pulpit committee? And he said, no. 
And I said, well, how are you going to become the pastor of the church if they don't know you want to be? And he said, that's how I know it'll be God. That's a bad plan. <laughs> that's a bad plan. Jesus did not say that God is just going to open doors and pull you through them. Jesus said you knock on doors and then they will be open for you. And there's no such thing as going through life without putting ourselves out there. You have, to, you have to knock on those things. And what can happen is, is that God can use those temporary, that temporary provision to teach you some skills and maybe even some management abilities that are going to prove very powerful in your life later on. You can also learn this. Not only is there temporary provision, there's a temporary assignment that God can give you. Maybe he has you there not for you. Maybe he has you there for someone else. Maybe there's someone that needs your skills or your support or your encouragement. It's very easy to get caught into the world view where we just simply say, the only reason I have a job is for what I can get out of it. Maybe part of the reason we have a job is for what we can give into it. And so don't get sucked into that kind of uh, uh, very, very narrow bandwidth of thinking about our job. What can you give into it? You can learn a lot in a job you don't like. Uh, you can learn a lot in those jobs. You can learn about yourself. You can learn about your character. Uh, when I came out of high school, I worked for a year in a furniture factory before I went into college. And I will tell you, I learned a lot about my character in those days. And what I learned was not all that impressive. It's entirely possible that God set that up so I would deal with stuff before I went into ministry. Because nobody needs a pastor like I went into that factory. Maybe we can learn patience. Maybe you can learn how to handle correction. Maybe you can learn how to work through difficult problems. It's a temporary assignment where you're learning a set of skills that's going to benefit you a lot later on. Well, when we're using the abilities and the opportunities God has, and we're engaged in work, there's four things that I would like you to remember. And the first is this. Remember who you work for. Maybe you're here going, I can't forget who I work for. It's the biggest idiot on the planet. And I would just say, wait a minute. Maybe you don't work for who you think you do. This is what it says in Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for who? The Lord, not for human masters. You see, God is the one who gave you the ability, and God is the one who gave you the opportunity. So really, you're working for God. He's just using that company to sign your paycheck. We work for God. Also, you need to remember who you're working with. Who do you work with? So, oh, I know my coworkers, and maybe you would prefer not to spend as much time with them, but wait a minute. You might be working with someone you haven't thought about yet. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, we are not much of an agrarian society anymore, so this might not mean as much to us as it did to someone else. But in the, in the agricultural world, if you can get two animals pulling a plow, you can accomplish a lot more than if you just have one animal pulling a plow. In fact, if you have two animals and two plows, you will get less work done than if you bind those animals together, yoke them together, and they pull a single plow together. Two animals yoked together accomplish more than two animals separately. And what Jesus is saying here is that when you are engaged in work that is hard and challenging and difficult, yoke yourself to me because I will teach you things about how to do that and I will provide additional strength for you and you can do a lot better and a lot more if you yoke yourself to me. In fact, you will find rest for your souls. Now, this is really interesting because uh, this is what's true. The number one indicator of your life satisfaction, the number one indicator of your life satisfaction is not who you married, it's not how healthy you are, and it's not uh, uh, how much money you have. 
the number one indicator of life satisfaction is job satisfaction. And if you hate your job, more than likely you hate your life. And so what Jesus wants us to know is even in difficult circumstances like that, we can put his yoke on us and that he adds his strength and his wisdom and we can learn from him and it actually goes better. We can accomplish more. And we can ask ourselves this, if Jesus was doing this job, how would he do it? If Jesus were cleaning the windows, how do you think he would clean the windows? If Jesus were vacuuming the rugs, how do you think Jesus would vacuum the rugs? Do you think Jesus would go just, oh yeah, good enough? Or do you think he would get it right? You see, God may not be running your company, and he may not be managing the employees, but he is present. And you can yoke yourself to him no matter where you are. Third thing to remember about work, and that is you should expect problems. You should expect problems. Some people think if I could find the right job, there wouldn't be any problems. That's not true. There's no such thing as a problem-free life. The only people who have no problems are in heaven. All the rest of us have problems. And you might be sitting there and going, yeah, I know, I'm sitting next to mine. But don't, don't say that out loud, all right? So this, look at what Jesus said. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have what? Trouble. Trouble. Trouble starts with T, and that rhymes with P, and that stands for problems. <laughs> it's not a musical, folks. Come on. <laughs> problems. But take heart. I have overcome the world. You see, Jesus does not say... I know the secret of avoiding all problems. He doesn't say that. He said he overcame the problems, not that he avoided them. And he doesn't say, I've overcome them, so now you won't have any. He says very clearly, you will have problems. But the presence of Jesus can get us through them. The presence of Jesus can help us in them. You see, work is hard. Before sin entered the world, work was not hard. There was no frustration involved in it. But when you read in the third chapter of Genesis and sin entered our world, this is what it says about the work experience. These are the words it uses. It says, after sin, there would be painful toil, thorns, thistles, and sweat. That's what it says about work. So you should anticipate that there will be challenges in your work environment. And the fourth thing I would want you to uh, remember is this. Do not allow anyone to keep you from doing your best. Don't allow anyone to keep you from doing your best. Don't use someone else as an excuse for doing less or for giving less or for being less. See, every single one of us bring a little something to our work environment. And there's only two eternal sources that we can bring to that. And one is, some of us can bring a little bit of heaven into our environment. And some of us can bring a little hell into our environment. And it's astonishing to me that, that so many of us who have experienced the grace of God can, in work environments, wind up bringing something from a place that we'll never know. Why do we do that? How do we do that? Well, we can do it with attitude. Some people's attitude, they just have a great attitude. Other people, nothing's ever right enough or good enough. Effort, some people can, can give even more than what's expected. Other people to see how little, when you see how little, when you're stingy with your abilities, when you're stingy with your energy, do you think that represents heaven or hell? It's absolutely amazing. Influence. We have an influence that is either touched by heaven or touched by hell. In the course of your lifetime, you will know over 1,000 people. And each one of those people will know 1,000 people. That means you are one person away from 1 million people and two people away from 1 billion people, which means the potential influence of your life is incalculable. When we bring heaven into whatever environment we are in, the ripple effect can affect as many as a billion people on the face of this planet. And yet we often surrender to the notion that what I do makes no difference, has no impact. And the reason we think that 
is because we're not getting what we want. And I would just tell you, give heaven where you go instead of giving hell where you go. I, I was in a restaurant one time with a friend of mine, and, and, and the waitress said, what would you like for breakfast? And my friend said, I'd like scrambled eggs with a human hair in it. I would like some toast that is cold. I would like coffee that is even colder than the toast. I'd like some hash browns that are burned. And the waitress said, I'm sorry. I don't think I can get that for you. And he said, well, you did the last time I was here. Isn't that a great attitude? <laughs> By the way, that same guy, I paid for that breakfast. I left a tip. And as I was walking out the restaurant, I watched him go back to the table and pick up my tip. You think he's bringing a little heaven or a little hell into this world? Yeah. It's not a rhetorical question. It was a real one. <laughs> You have influence you can't calculate. And here's another thing. Wisdom actually is gained from doing something difficult. Have you noticed that when you've got more than enough money and more than enough friends and more than enough stuff and more than enough opportunity, very rarely do you go into a closet and shut yourself in with God and say, oh God, give me wisdom on how to do all of this stuff. What do we do? We usually think, I've got the wisdom, that's why I have all this stuff. It is when we feel like we have less, when something is hard. That's when we seek the wisdom of God. And it's where you figure things out. We learn to problem solve in tough times. You don't need a better job to do a better job. It's a decision. I want heaven to invade wherever I am. Jesus did a great job. When he taught no one forgot his lessons. When he saw powerful people taking advantage of others, he stood up to them and showed incredible courage. When he saw the hungry, he fed them. When he saw the sick, he healed them. When he saw people who were living in all kinds of emotional, spiritual, psychological, and physical bondage, he found ways to free them. Jesus did his job really, really well, yet that did not exempt him from suffering. The guy who did his job, any performance evaluation Jesus would have gotten, it would have been all highest scores ever, and yet he still suffered. But he didn't allow suffering to redefine him. He didn't allow suffering to weaken his resolve. He didn't allow suffering to erode his trust in his heavenly Father. He finished his job. We have his words recorded for us on the cross. It is finished. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. He finished his job. And he committed himself to his father. These are his dying words. This is what he says. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, I'm, when I say this, you're going, well, he was Jesus. He was the son of God. I don't have the resolve of Jesus. I don't have the wisdom of Jesus. I don't have the strength of Jesus. And you are absolutely right. But I want to remind you, you do have Jesus. You have him. He is present, and he is able to help us in difficult situations. He understands your situation better than you realize or can possibly imagine, and he can actually help us with action steps. How does he do this? It's the most fascinating thing. It, it's like an idea or a thought will come to your mind. It, it has already happened to you lots of times, and it will continue to happen to you. You'll be in a work environment, and you'll think, oh, I could help that person, and then you'll have another thought, but they never help me. And besides, they made fun of me. And besides, I don't like them. And, and we'll just go all the way down our list until now we're, it'd be a crazy person that would help them. Why would I do that? Or I could work a little harder on this. Well, nobody else is working any harder. Why should I put out more? I'm getting paid less, and they're getting paid more, and they're doing less than I. I'm not going to do that. Well, congratulations. You're allowing hell to invade your work environment one more time. See, God will actually give us ideas and prompt us with steps and make suggestions to us that can allow heaven to flow into our world and grace to flow through it. And I can't imagine the difference that our world would experience if everyone who named the name of Jesus, whenever they showed up in a work environment, just tried to allow heaven to show up with them and followed whatever prompting God gave them. How much better would our world be? 
Let's bow our heads this morning. I, I think the first thing I would say is if you're in a job you don't like, don't assume that that's a lifetime assignment. The, the second thing I would say is if the only reason you're doing your job is because it makes more money than the thing you really love, maybe you need to reorder some of your life so you can do what you're able to do. And the third thing I would say is maybe you're here today and you are trying everything you can to get a job and you just, it's not happening. You're knocking on every door. And I would just say, keep on knocking. And maybe one of the things you need to do for a little while is, is to find ways to volunteer. To trust that God is going to open a door because you are willing to use your energy to add value to our world. So Father, I ask that you would help us today. Uh, some of us have very stressful work environments. And some of us work for people that don't understand or quite honestly don't seem to care about us. And some of us feel like we are inadequately compensated and we struggle every month to get through it. Father, I would ask that in every single one of these scenarios and others that I haven't even mentioned, you would help us realize that you have come to provide for all of our needs. And that the way you will do that is providing us not only with abilities, but opportunities. And if we will step into them, you will accomplish your purpose in us and through us. For that we thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.